Welcome. Thank you all for joining us for this final plenary of the Ocean Sciences meeting. I'm Margie Friedrichs, a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and I'm honored to be a co-chair of this year's Ocean Sciences meeting. Together, our three sponsoring societies, AGU, ASLO, and TAS, have been involved with planning discussions for the upcoming Ocean Decade, an effort initiated by the United Nations to create a new foundation across the science policy interface to strengthen the management of our oceans and coasts for the benefit of humanity. Last May, AGU's Executive Director and CEO, Chris McEntee, joined today's plenary speaker, Margaret Leinen, in Copenhagen for the first ever UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission Global Planning Meeting for the Ocean Decade. The ocean sciences community has proven time and again that it is con committed to sustainability and the discussions that have been part of this meeting will allow us all to work across disciplines to benefit our society and planet. Scientist members of AGU, ASLO, and TAS are already paving the way for ocean resilience. This week's forward-looking meeting has helped to advance that work. Our global communities are passionate about scientific research and discoveries, and we look forward to helping secure the future of for Earth's oceans. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our final plenary speaker, a distinguished leading scientist in oceanography. Margaret Leinen was appointed the 11th director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego in 2013. She also serves as UC San Diego's vice chancellor for marine sciences and dean of the School of Marine Sciences. Leinen is an award-winning oceanographer with extensive national and international experience in ocean science, global climate and environmental issues, federal research administration, as well as nonprofit startups. She's a researcher in paleooceanography and paleoclimatology with her work focusing on ocean sediments and their relationship to global biogeochemical cycles and the history of Earth's ocean and climate. Prior to joining Scripps, she served in several roles at both Florida Atlantic University and the University of Rhode Island and was also the Assistant Director for Geoscience at the National Science Foundation. She is the founder and served as president of the Climate Response Fund, a nonprofit organization that worked to foster discussion of climate engineering research and to decrease the risk that these techniques might be called upon or deployed before they're adequately understood and regulated. She is past president of both TAS and AGU, a member of the Distinguished Leadership Council of the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative, and past chair of the Atmospheric and Hydrospheric Science section of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. She is also a member of the Executive Planning Group of the United Nations Decade of, for, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, an expert group who serve as an advisory body to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission to support the development of the implementation plan as well as the preparatory activities of the decade. In 2016, Leinen began service as a U.S. science envoy, focusing on ocean science in Latin America, East Asia, and the Pacific. She is a fellow of AAAS, the Geological Society of America, AGU, and TAS, and has been awarded Distinguished Alumni Awards from all three universities she attended as a student, the University of Illinois, Oregon State University, and the University of Rhode Island. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Leinen. Thanks, Margie. Boy, I can't believe how many of you are still here. If I had realized that an ice cream social was such an attraction, we would be having a lot more of them at Scripps uh, around faculty meetings. It has been quite an ocean science meeting. And uh, the, the uh, organizing group gave me some of the statistics so I could show, share them with you. 6,300 attendees in spite of coronavirus, uh, 66 countries represented, 32% students. Well, you can read it. It's an amazing, amazing meeting. And all of that doesn't happen just uh, by accident. Uh, you have met your organizing committee several times, but please join me in thanking the representatives of TOS. AGU and ASLO, both from the program committees and the, the uh, uh, 
the CEOs of those programs who make this possible for us. Thank you so much. So TOSS is 22, ESLO is 84, and last year AGU turned 100. And together, uh, they finally came together to, uh, to put this remarkable meeting together for us. And it's quite a different meeting than the first uh, Ocean Sciences meeting that I went to or the first AGU that I went to a long time ago. Uh, we now understand that having a meeting like this is not just about everybody standing up and telling us what they did, but it's also an opportunity for us to share new ideas for the future. We didn't used to have town halls that you know, took up multiple spaces every single night uh, and during the day. Uh, we now know that we really need to call on everybody to be part of this uh, activity. So the special programs for, that enhance the diversity of our field that provide opportunities for students and early career ocean professionals to come together and to really take their place because it is their ocean, it is their science, it is their future. And uh, uh, we're just partial stewards, we're just the temporary stewards of it. So uh, when I give talks, I usually start them with a slide that looks something like this. It's the iconic Scripps Pier. And of course, since we face west, uh, anytime you see the sun there, it's a sunset. But I feel a lot more optimistic about the ocean and about ocean science than that. So this is a sunrise taken very close to where we are now uh, on San Diego Bay. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I am so optimistic uh, and, and how I think that that is playing out and is going to play out in the future. And in spite of all of the difficulties that we've talked about with the ocean and certainly saw so many sessions here on uh, various kinds of pollution, uh, uh, all of the challenges that are coming from climate change and so forth, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And lately I've been saying that the ocean is having a moment. And by that I mean that it is being recognized in a way that we have been talking about for a long time. Uh, the night before last, Tim Gallaudet, Admiral Gallaudet, um, the head of the ocean part of NOAA said, uh, he, he defines it or describes it as the oceans are on a roll. So whether it's a roll or whether it's a moment, uh, we are in the midst of one. And this is not only such a huge opportunity for us, but I think it's going to transform our field. And I'm going to tell you about the things that, some of the reasons that I am so optimistic and highlight some things that have just taken place not only in the last decade, but really in the last five years. And the first one of those was the initiation of what has become the annual Our Ocean Conference. It was started by then Secretary of State John Kerry, who brought together not the environmental ministers or the science ministers or the heads of science agencies in countries, he reached out to the foreign ministers, the ministers of state, and invited them to come to the U.S. to hear about why our ocean was so important and why it was under such threat. So on the uh, upper right is Prince Albert II of Monaco, a, an incredible hero of the ocean, and so many more who came together, really focused around marine protected areas and ocean acidification, but really raising oceans in visibility. One of my favorite scenes from that was our own Eric Lindstrom there, mansplaining ocean circulation to Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and uh, uh, there were a host of other celebrities uh, that attended this, and it really brought oceans into a new kind of framing 
not the science ministers and the environmental ministers, but the people who are responsible for the overall well-being of, of countries. That first uh, Our Ocean Summit resulted in 800 million in pledges for action on marine protected areas and ocean acidification. Five years later, uh, ocean, Our Ocean Summit still going on. In 2019, they upped the ante by two orders of magnitude and 64 billion were committed for action not only in marine protected areas and ocean acidification, but a much broader agenda, including sustainable coastal development, sustainable seafood production, and so forth. So that the, the slide, the poster for Our Ocean 19 was this. Uh, 1,030 commitments, 69 countries, six years, one ocean. In my life, I have not seen that kind of, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> Uh, I have not seen that kind of attention or action on the ocean. To give you a sense of what it does, uh, this is the one graph in my talk, uh, and it's the percent area of protected oceans. The red are the, those that are just protected in name, and the blue is those that are strongly protected. And the, and the numbers are low, of, co of course, only 5.5% uh, in, at the beginning of uh, 2019 that were protected. But the message is what's happening with that curve and how quickly it changed when this was raised to the level of national visibility. Not by us, we certainly carried the message, but by the people who changed people's minds, like Leonardo DiCaprio, and the people who changed government's actions like secretaries of state and foreign ministries. An incredible success story for us. The next year, the G7, the group of seven nations, the biggest, wealthiest nations in the world, took up prevention of marine litter and plastic pollution. Why is it important that the G7 does something like that? The actions of the G7 are really a template for the actions of the world. Their agenda spills over into the G20, the, the 20 largest nations. It often spills over into the G77, uh, the, the developing nations of the world, and into the UN. So it's sort of a trial run for getting big ideas onto the international agenda. Now, you may not realize it, but the G7 discusses oceans almost every year, but they're not discussing the things that have been on our agenda. They've been discussing things like um, restrictions for international trade or performance of ports. Uh, tr marine trade is a big thing, and it has been most of the agenda for the oceans, and that's because global trade is marine trade. 95% of global trade uh, goes, is transported uh, on the oceans. But this group, uh, they're in Germany, took up plastic pollution. Uh, they heard the word from their citizens and the calls of concern about plastic. Now, many of us, and, and I loved the uh, plenary a uh, couple of days ago saying that, you know, the, the plastic pollution was not uh, that big chunk of stuff in uh, uh, a drifting net, but it was that petri dish with uh, microplastic. And while the, most of the calls for this originated with people showing entangled tortoises and you know gross plastic pollution in, in coastal waters, they got the message and they took it up. The next year, the G7 took up the future of the seas and the ocean. The G7. There's the group. That meeting was in Japan. And this was their statement. And you can read as well as I can, so I'm just going to let you read that for a moment.
enhanced global sea and ocean observation. It's us. Through the, through the global Argo network, it's us. Uh, coordinating, et cetera. Enhanced system of ocean assessment. That's the world ocean assessment. And while you may not have been happy with the chapter that touched on your area, if you read the first IPCC assessment, you wouldn't think much of it either. The second world ocean assessment is underway, and the intention is to build that into an assessment like IPCC that will really allow us to, to communicate uh, what we do with the rest of the world. Improvement of global data sharing infrastructure, strengthening collaboration, regional observing capabilities, promoting political co cooperation. If you look at the words, they sound a lot like one of us might have said them. And the story behind the story is that people in our community did write this. So a few people from the nations of the G7 who were in a, a particularly uh, good place to be able to talk with the foreign ministries uh, got together, worked certainly with the agencies in those countries, but also using their expertise as scienti science scientists, uh, put this agenda together, which then spilled over into the G20. It was taken up by the G77 and became the framework for this international attention for the oceans. It, it's a moment, for sure. And we certainly wanted people to notice us, uh, and they have. But the focus that they have is not just on what we do, but what we can do to make their lives better. And that's the focus of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So 2017, the year after the G7 took up the future of the seas and the ocean, uh, the IOC proposed to uh, the UN General Assembly that there be a UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And those last three words, for sustainable development, are the real key. Because the sustainable development goals is what the UN is all about now. And you've, I know you've all seen these. It's what the UN wants. It's what most people in the world want. You know, an end of, of poverty, uh, high quality education, uh, freedom from, from health, uh, uh, and health defects and disease. And then across the bottom, our particular environmental focus, climate change, the oceans, uh, the, the terrestrial uh, biosphere and land uh, and ecosystems. And the, what the UN was looking for was a way for ocean science to assist in reaching these goals, to provide the ocean we need for the, that future that we want. So the UN has been used to having agendas that are negotiating agendas. So we have the climate change uh, agenda of uh, the UNFCCC. We have the law of the sea. Uh, SDI, SIDS is small island developing states and the Samoa pathway. These are all uh, organizations that get together and negotiate activities toward reaching those goals. And what the IOC said we needed was a global framework that ensured that ocean science, so critical to so many of these, can help governments and societies achieve that ocean for the future we want. So we're in the preparatory phase of the UN decade from 2018 to 2020. And uh, as Margie said, uh, you, uh, IOC established a, uh, an executive planning group, and the white frames around three people were, uh, that's um, Craig McLean from NOAA, Martin Visbeck, and myself, whom you've seen around the meeting all, all week, trying to not only talk to you about the decade, but get input on what you need uh, to know about it and how you can participate. 
So the words on the left are ones that resonate with us. Uh, degradation of habitats, climate regulation, et cetera. But if I told my sister that I was concerned about climate regulation, she would smile and, at me and say, I'm glad somebody's doing that. She wouldn't have a clue what we were talking about. And so the UN decade really sought to identify big 100,000 foot uh, goals that people could resonate with, a clean ocean. Now again, if I told my sister that we needed to reduce non-point uh, source nitrogen pollution in the ocean, uh, she would you know, shake her head and say, you know, I'm glad you're doing that, but she wouldn't have a clue what it meant. And so these outcomes, uh, these big goals for the decade are meant to be framed in a way that the public can, can understand them, uh, that you can talk to uh, your children or your mother or your neighbor about them or a local legislator. Clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean that's really focused on ecosystems, a predicted ocean. Can we understand the ocean well enough to be able to tell um, groups what the consequences are for the ocean of their action? And what would happen if they undertook a certain path uh, to try to reach sustainability? So getting that predictive capability. A safe ocean. And uh, I've, I've told IOC several times, it's not really the ocean that we want to be safe, but people want to feel safe from threats in the ocean, sea level rise, tsunamis, harmful algal blooms. A sustainable and productive ocean, here's where we come to food security. And the last one, a transparent and accessible ocean, doesn't mean that it's transparent in the way that our acousticians would think of it, but really uh, that it is understandable, knowable to people, and accessible in the sense of being able to get at information about it easily. So those are the overarching goals of the, the decade. How do we get to those? In, in, as a sort of straw man for the decade, uh, IOC and the members of IOC uh, developed what they called a roadmap, and it was really a notional roadmap, not meant to be the ultimate goals. But they identified a number of uh, potential research and development priority areas, and now they sound more like us. Uh, mapping the entire ocean floor, conducting an inventory of ecosystems, integrated models for ocean prediction, uh, strengthening capabilities and accelerating technology transfer and ocean literacy. So these come closer to, to things that we resonate with. That capacity building piece is a really important one, and this amazing map is a map that shows the relative size of nations in terms of their scientific publications. So of course the US is pretty big, China is pretty big, Europe is, is incredibly large. If you look at Africa, with the exception of a little tail that's South Africa, Africa is missing. Uh, Latin America is very small. Uh, the, the ability of us to really reach those goals for all and, uh, and do ocean science in all of the areas that we need to do it is critically dependent on building uh, capacity. And so a major piece of the decade is focused on that. We'll have to uh, both improve ocean literacy, improve education. And this is a really, it's as big a part of the decade as is the science. So faced with that, most of us are probably thinking, okay, we've got the ocean, here's my postage stamp, and uh, I wanna make sure my postage stamp is in the plan. And what we've done to try to uh, engage all of you to understand what those are and to be able to make them more than postage stamps, but to pull them together 
into much larger programs and initiatives is go through a period of planning. And the, uh, uh, this is um, essentially the last uh, two years. Um, I don't know if, no, this doesn't really work, okay. Uh, it began in 2018. Uh, it was a UN activity, so it started really slowly. Uh, the first executive planning group meeting wasn't until December of that year. Uh, and then we essentially had a year to get our act together and a few months to uh, generate the plans for the decade uh, before it was going to start at the beginning of 2021. So we have been uh, engaged in a, a number of regional workshops with primarily the science community, uh, certainly some of the capacity building community, MGOs, et cetera. But all of these areas have had uh, workshops to focus on what the important issues were and, and, and uh, activities were within, within individual uh, areas. And here at um, the Ocean Sciences meeting, uh, there was an Antarctic workshop. Uh, and we still have one coming up in Mexico for the Caribbean and a second Arctic meeting in Copenhagen. But this regional activity is pretty much uh, complete. And then we have been, as I said, uh, speaking everywhere. So if you've been to any of those uh, meetings, you have seen uh, town halls or discussion sessions or presentations on the decade to try to keep you informed as this was developing. Uh, because it isn't finished yet, it's still, we're close, but there's still work to be done. So what it, what it talks about is a framework for cooperation. Uh, certainly the science, synthesizing existing research and mobilizing people to be able to uh, put big priorities in front of us uh, to reach uh, those, those sustainable uh, goals. But it also emphasizes that this has to be done within the community uh, not just of us, but business, philanthropy, government, nonprofits, and that we need to co-design the approach to the research strategies so that they will be appropriate for sustainable development. Um, bringing in science and policy for society into the, the discussion of these priorities and uh, being able to assess the results of them. Uh, fostering new kinds of research and co cooperation. So you should think of it as a framework, a platform for you to use to really get your science into the place that it can be effective for sustainable development. Uh, I mentioned that uh, all of those communities have to be involved. Uh, the science community we've engaged through through those regional meetings, through meetings at, at uh, uh, scientific meeting, all through scientific meetings, also through SCORE and Pisces and all of those organizations that, that serve us. The private sector uh, is being engaged through a couple of big uh, mechanisms that the UN has, the UN Global Compact, OECD, and so forth. Next week, uh, I'll be in uh, Copenhagen for a meeting of uh, about 50 uh, very large philanthropic organizations that are forming an Ocean Foundations Alliance to help support the decade and to align their investments uh, with the, the goals of the decade. And then there are all the UN partners like FAO and the International Maritime Organization and all of those bodies and IOC is taking the lead there. In all of this, I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, and I want to emphasize again, that the, since the decade will go on for so long, it's really important for us to entrain early career uh, professionals and, and students and youth in this effort so that it is their decade, it's their future, uh, and that, they, that at the end of the decade, they will be fully empowered to keep going. So uh, how do, what kind of actual plan is going to be generated? 
Uh, there will be an implementation plan that will include elements like a science plan, capacity development, uh, resources, monitoring, reporting. The UN re expects reports back. Communications and engagement. The IOC is taking this very seriously and has engaged professional communications groups to, uh, to help us with that. So if it was great for our ocean uh, to have Leonardo DiCaprio listening to Eric Lindstrom, we want him to be communicating about how important the oceans are and how important this decade is. So one goal in addition to sustainable development is perhaps at the end of a decade, everybody knows there has been uh, an ocean decade. Um, so the science plan. The science plan isn't the sort of plan that you would think of if you were generating a big science program uh, that, that said, you know, we're going to go here for this long, we're going to do this, these are the people that are going to be involved. It's really a guide for what kind of science will be part of the decade, not which specific science will be done. And so we've identified a number of principles uh, that define what kind of science we're talking about. We're talking about inclusive activities with contributions from all components of society, youth, early career uh, uh, professionals, all genders, underrepresented groups, a big tent, all involved and all involved in the planning. Science based on partnerships between many disciplines and sectors that in also integrate social and cultural values and again that are co-developed with the ocean science community to reach those sustainable development goals. The science should be transformative in nature, facilitating, facilitating a step change in our understanding of the ocean systems. And that doesn't mean that you as an individual have to argue that your research on its own uh, is going to transform everything, but that it should be attached to part of activities which roll up and taken together are transformative. And finally, that it should con contribute to a global and equitable, sustainable future sharing of resources, capacity building, and outputs that are shared by all. So those are, uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of the uh, individual pieces, but below this there are some things that you will resonate with. Uh, actions to advance global ocean-based observations to develop and implement new technologies and so forth. Uh, but it's more a, a guide than it is a specific plan. So now I'd like to turn from the ocean decade to, the, um, to climate change and IPCC because this is another area that has been so frustrating to our community. We all know that ocean and climate are joined at the hip. And I always used to say that it was not for nothing that Sustainable Development Goal 13 was next to 14, climate change and oceans. But it has been a slog to try to get oceans considered as part of uh, IPCC assessment or as part of the negotiations. But then uh, a big breakthrough uh, happened uh, as a result of a lot of efforts with um, with UNFCCC. And so the Framework Convention, the negotiating body, asked IPCC to do a report on the oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. And that, as you know, was completed in 2019. The news was not good. In fact, it was uh, alarming. And I think that when you know, and everybody was talking about, okay, it's coming, and uh, you know, the the IPCC report would would show uh, all of these dramatic changes in the ocean that we know so well, but that the public and and other parts of the climate community didn't know so well. And I think that when this came out, it really was a game changer for uh, for the 
UNFCCC for the whole climate change negotiation process. And so the UNFCCC is now preparing to include oceans in the Paris Agreement. This was the day that the Paris Agreement was accepted by all. It was a jubilant crowd, and they felt that they'd finally made big headway. That document, the Paris Agreement, the negotiated document, was the first document negotiation document that even included the word ocean as part of the negotiation. And there it is, and that's all there was. It's not much to hang your hat on. But together with the, the IPCC assessment, it really has resulted in uh, an increasing drumbeat within the IPC, within the UN uh, process, such that the last conference of the parties in December, which was organized by Chile, was designed by Chile to be what they called the blue cop, the time when the oceans come into climate negotiations. And a result of that was much more consideration of the ocean and some statements that we had worked for for so long and were beginning to feel we would never see. So in UN talk, they noted the importance of the ocean, including as an integral part of Earth's climate system. You know, for me, when I saw that, the Earth moved emphasizing the importance of ensuring the integrity of ocean and coastal ecosystems. Now they have gone way beyond physical climate and are talking about, not, and not only talking about forests and agriculture and so forth, but ocean and coastal ecosystems. And so they did what UN bodies do when they are going to start thinking about something. They passed it on to what's called a substa a subsidiary body for science and technological advice. And what goes to the subska, substa gets discussed and then becomes part of the negotiation. So they ask the substa to consider, in a holistic and integrated manner, ways to strengthen the ocean climate change mitigation and adaptation actions. And to pull all of this together and present it for consideration of the next COP next year in Ireland. And at that point, the substance uh, suggestions will become part of the negotiation. And for the first time in 26 years, the oceans and climate will truly be joined at the hip. This has all happened in five years. It is astonishing. Yes, we worked for a long time to make it happen, but once this started happening, it happened very fast. The reason that I'm showing this slide, it's the interior of the Berkeley Ferry down the road from here. It's a late 19th century ferry from San Francisco that's part of the San Diego Maritime Museum. And uh, I had a meeting there earlier this uh, week with a number of US philanthropic and NGO organizations that want to come together to help work on the decade. And we had uh, a short talk from the, uh, the CEO of, uh, of the Maritime Museum, Raymond Ashley, Dr. Ashley. And he reminded us, and this isn't the only ship, there are sailing ships, there are uh, swift boat ships, there are uh, all kinds of ships in the Maritime Museum. And he said, when these ships were built, the sea was certainly a resource, but it was looked at as a dangerous opponent to be conquered. And so the sense of the ships was that they were the buffer between people 
and this dangerous ocean environment. And he said that we were, not, we were too good at conquering the ocean and that a new frame is necessary. And I told him that that's exactly what Nainoa Thompson told us last Sunday night. I hope all of you got a chance to see it. It was an amazing talk. And Nainoa, in contrast to the ship being like a suit of armor protecting us from the ocean, he said, the ship is your school. It's where we learn about the ocean. We, and he highlighted the fact that the Hokulea was not something protecting the people on the ship from the ocean, but was a way for them to interact with the ocean. He said, we have the science, we have the education, we need the culture, we need the stories. And I think that your stories have made such a difference. Your stories were what compelled your neighbors to think about coral reefs and plastic and to call for ocean conservation and to raise this to the visibility that those early um, uh, meetings in the last decade could run with it. It was your stories that made such a difference. He also told us that we need a new sail plan, a different one from the one we've had. And I think that the UN decade, that the negotiation over climate gives us a framework to develop that new plan. That plan that absolutely has to include our partners in the social science, in the arts, in the humanities, to come together to talk not just about how great our science is and what it's going to do, but also to talk about how it comes together to truly make sustainable development happen. And so I hope that as ocean science meeting evolves, that we'll also be evolving into a way and a place and a platform and a meeting at which we can have those conversations. Not just look at the art that's in the poster session, but understand more completely how to use it to communicate. Not just have a few sessions that talk about how we incorporated social science, but to really make it a part of our culture. And I think we'll be doing that. This wonderful set of maps uh, were developed in 1942 by Athelstan Spillhouse. Athelstan was the person who argued most passionately and most publicly for Sea Grant. And he wanted a map that showed the ocean in one figure, that you didn't have to turn around the globe to see it, but that had some relationship that way. And this Spillhouse map has just been redone or redesigned by Esri. And they have this fabulous map, the ocean at the center of the, all of the nations around it, the center of our future, our economies, our quality of life, our, our security, our food supply, the center of our lives. And that's what makes me optimistic. Thanks. We do have a little time for a question or two. We have a couple of microphones in the center aisle. Um, anyone would like to make their way to ask a question of Margaret? They're waiting for ice cream. Yes, I know, the ice cream is calling. Yes. Thank okay. you, Margie. Yes, let's thank Margaret one more time.
So before we all leave here and return to our respective institutions, I just want to thank those that have been so instrumental in the success of this meeting, including my co-chairs, Alessandra Conversi and Kristen Buck, who would now like to join me on stage. So the, the three of us would like to uh, thank the entire program committee, the leadership from the three societies co-organizing the meeting, specifically Jan Jenny Remeroy from TOS, Helen Schneider LeMay from ASLO, and most of all, Nicole Oliphant and Heather Nally from AGU for leading us through the challenges of two years of meeting planning. And finally, I want to thank all of you for making this meeting the success it has been. Without scientists like you willing to come and present your research, asking probing questions, instigating stimulating discussions, and participating in our various sessions and events throughout the week, the meetings simply would not have been possible. I also want to mention that we are now looking forward to our next meeting in Honolulu in 2022. So in that vein, I would like to invite the three chairs of the Ocean Sciences 2022 meeting to join us on stage. Allison Penko, representing AGU. Bob Chen, representing ASLO. And Grace Chang, representing TOSS. So these three individuals have agreed to give their time to lead the organization of the 2022 Ocean Sciences meeting. And I wish you all the best in planning what I know will be an equally successful meeting. <laughs> so now it's time for our final farewell ice cream reception. Please join me out in the lobby to help, uh, help celebrate the conclusion of an inspirational and informative week of Ocean Science. Thank you.